Let's go first about what is input lag or input latency in Ableton. So you have a MIDI input, for example, from your MIDI keyboard or your MIDI controller. And then until you hear the audio signal, there is some time delay in between. So for example, you're pressing the MIDI keyboard and then you wait a little bit and then you hear the sound coming. And that's something you obviously want to avoid. And why you want to avoid this? Because let's imagine you have a melody and then you want to play something on the melody, like a second, a counter melody, then this will be very hard whenever you hit a note and it comes late and actually is then maybe not really merging with the original melody. The same thing goes for automations or if you do rhythmic games, so you have rhythm A and you want to make a responding rhythm B. So that can be a huge problem actually if you have too much MIDI lag in there. And I have multiple solutions for you. There's first some basic ones I want to show you, which you find all over the internet. And then there's my special hack to this, which in my opinion is also the way bigger improvement and it will really be a game changer for you. If you don't want to miss out on new videos, YouTube is not automatically showing you all the videos. So if you hit the subscribe button and the bell icon, and the bell icon is the important thing, then YouTube will show you whenever I put out a new video so that you can decide if it's something for you or not. So let's start with the simple but less important thing. If you go here to live preferences, then you see a latency setting. And the overall latency is at the moment, because this is like a clean project, at 1.45 milliseconds. So one could assume now that if I hit my MIDI keyboard that 1.45 milliseconds, I should have my audio signal. But that's not true. The rabbit hole is way deeper, as we will see later in this video. But for now, let's focus on this setting. So when you increase the buffer size, and what is the buffer size actually? The buffer size is how much samples Ableton buffers in order to process them. And why does it need to buffer samples? Because it costs CPU to process audio. And the higher the buffer is, the more leeway Ableton has to process things. So sometimes things go faster, some things go slower. And if you have kind of like this huge amount of bonus time, you could say, then it's easier to process them and get it fluently in the end. What happens actually if Ableton doesn't have enough buffer left to process the audio and it doesn't manage to process this in time, then you will get audio crackles and noise and all kind of unwanted behaviors, which you don't want to have in your audio signal because it makes it a mess to listen to it. And you can try this, take a full project of yours and put it down to 32 samples and you will not be able to listen that, to that project anymore, I guarantee you. Besides, you have some crazy supercomputer and that's actually the point. So put the buffer size as low as your computer allows. So the better your computer is, usually the lower you can put your buffer size and the faster it will react, the less output latency it will have. And if you don't have a crazy computer, there's uh, some simple strategies how you can save up CPU. So first of all, you can see how much CPU you're using here. There's like a CPU meter and if you have this is worn on current CPU overload activated, then you will also see here that it gets orange whenever you exceeded the CPU. And there's a bit of a special case with the M-Max. Um, so they switch how they process audio. So sometimes you can get the CPU overload in the beginning. And once you play for a while, it kind of like goes down again and see if you get like too much crackles and noise, or if it's just maybe something when you start to the track, then it might be acceptable still. Anyways, if you're having CPU problems, then you can either increase the buffer size or you can decrease your CPU load. And the first tip I have for that is that you close any external applications because they will also use your CPU and they will compete on your computer with your CPU. So for example, if I'm recording my videos here, I'm having open OBS, which takes quite a bit of CPU. So whenever I'm speaking here, I can actually see that it sometimes goes up here from my processing chain, which I also have in the recording software. If you can and reduce the overall CPU load in computer, then that's already a very good step. Then the second tip for you I have is use a lot of stock plugins because the stock plugins are very well optimized by Ableton for everything. And usually they don't use a lot of CPU. So for example, I use the EQ8 more than the Pro-Q. And yeah, I know there's a video out there which says the Pro-Q uses less CPU, but I don't believe in that. <laughs> if you have like a lot of tracks like me in the project, then you will actually notice that I think it's the other way around. Um, let me know in the comments what your experience is with EQ8 
and ProQ. But my tip is the more stock plugins you use, usually the less problems we have of all that latency and pre-delay compensation, which we also come later to. A third tip is you have a CPU meter here in Ableton. So whenever you put this C on here, this little bars will appear. And when you play your track, then you will see that some of those tracks here will have a very high CPU usage and some others will have a low one. And when you have tracks which have a very high CPU usage, then you can either freeze them or I would even recommend sometimes to flatten them because then you're sure that everything is just audio and doesn't use anything anymore, as we will see also later in this video. And you can just store the original version in your project by just dragging them over like this. If you drag it over like this, then it creates this little ALS project in your project. So I, I put this in the current project folder here. And then you can go in here and you can drag them back into your project. Also very good practice is that you use the send and return tracks here. By using that, you're not only creating like a room for your track. So for example, if you have, let's say five types of reverbs in your returns and you have only those five reverbs to choose. So everything will sound a little bit more coherent, but also you only have five reverb plugins and not like a hundred. If you put like a reverb in each track, like an individual reverb, then you will have a hundred plugins which use that CPU and you might save some up if you just use the return tracks for that. Please also like this video that helps me to spread this video to more producers like you and also shows me which topics you guys are interested in. Now I want to dive deeper with you into the rabbit hole. So as you can see, we have a buffer size of 32 samples here and an output latency of 1.45 milliseconds. So shouldn't we actually have, if we press our MIDI keyboard, an audio signal in 1.45 milliseconds later? And I tell you, it's not like that. So if I press this, one, two, three, then I can almost count up to three. Then I have two or three seconds in between the pressing of this key and my output. And why is that? Because I created an artificial scenario here in which I stuffed this project with a lot of plugins which have a huge latency. So for example, this one ProQ here has 116 milliseconds of latency. It's a linear phase EQ, so it uses a lot of time to process the signal. And also I have this track delay of minus three milliseconds here. So what happens actually here in Ableton? So Ableton cannot go back and time this three milliseconds. So whenever you put, for example, like a minus here, then if you hit play or press a key on your keyboard, then it will basically play this track first and the other two are played three milliseconds later. So because Ableton cannot travel back in time, but it can delay everything else. And the same happens with those plugins here. And it's called pre-delay compensation. So basically Ableton calculates everything and then decides what plays when in order to have everything finished by the output of your audio. So what happens actually? Let's imagine we have a track A and it takes one second to process and we have a track B and it takes two seconds to process. So Ableton will take the longest time, those two seconds, and then it will start its calculations. Uh, I don't know how it looks on the inside, but it could potentially wait on track A like one second to process it and start processing track B immediately. But the main point of this is that it will take two seconds until you get your audio output because otherwise it wouldn't have enough time to process it. And that's exactly what happened here. I created eight pro cues and all of those have 160 milliseconds. Okay, that's quite an exaggerated example, but I have tracks, especially in my kick and bass, where I have maybe two pro cues in there. I have a compressor, I have maybe a multiband compressor, I may have some other processing like a saturation plugin, and it can easily add up to stuff from 500 milliseconds to one second. And that's a lot of time because remember, as I said before, if you want to play a melody, it has to wait for all those plugins to finish until it can really start playing the music. You know, not long ago, I was not as good as I was now. I was not charting with any single track. Nobody wanted to listen to my music. And I guess a lot of you guys are in the same spot. And to be honest, maybe you're thinking I have like a special talent and I do not have. <laughs> I'm really, I'm so bad at rhythm, at hearing tones and everything, but I believe there is a structure to everything. In my opinion, Psycheon is not only an art, it's also a science. So 
everywhere there is kind of like a good thing in the center where you can deviate left and right. And that's basically the art thing in it. But there's always some point which works. And I found this out by watching like a lot of videos, masterclasses and taking like many, many hours of coaching. And if you want to learn what I found out and that I really can show you my concept and where I orientate when I start making music. And that's usually a good, very, very good starting point where you then can really bring your own style in. And if you want to take part in this, then it's really important that you hit the link up here or down in the description box and there you can register. And then when I gathered enough people to start a program, then I will send out an email and then you can register. So if you want to really take part in this one time life thing, then you should register now and then continue watching this video. And let me show you quickly on one of my projects how to pull this off. Here, for example, I have a kick and a bass in this project here. And I wanted to change the kick and bass, but the project was already quite crowded. So I have all those tracks in here. Anyways, it's quite a slow project. The buffer size is high. And I wanted to get like a fresh moment in which I can really tweak the kick and bass very fast and also at the same time make this project faster later. So what I did here is I took and imagine for a moment this would be still MIDI channels here. I just took this here and I deleted everything else. So I selected basically everything here in the project, hit delete. I won't do this because it will take quite a while to do this. And then I have this here and I have everything, all the returns and everything I have in here still there. So that's something I wanted to have like this. But if you don't need it, you can also remove those if you want. And then you can save this project as a new life set and you just save it into the same folder where your current project is. And as you can see, I have this 145 BPM breakout kick and bass. And you can do that with everything, basically. You can do that with your drums, you can do that with kick and bass. If you want to do a second brainstorm, let's say you have your track 80% done, but then you realize there's not enough pads in there or not enough leads and you want to create some new leads, but you don't want to have that MIDI lag and latency, then do a breakout session. So basically, you delete everything here, you copy to a new project, and then you open it and you have a fresh project which doesn't have all those restrictions. And once you're done, you have two options how you can get your stuff back. So the first one is, as you have saved this thing here as a project in your current folder, you can just uncollapse it and you can get whatever is in here and drag it over into your original project. Then you have your MIDI version, for example, back. I mean, it won't fasten up this project, but in the in the meantime, while you worked in this breakout session, while you had this project open, which doesn't have all the leads, FX, Brainstorm, Drums, and whatever in, you have been able to work faster there. And once you have finished, you just save it up and you can just drag it over here again. And if you want to make this project also faster, as I have shown in the beginning, it took quite a while until anything happened, then you can, instead of re-importing this one here, you can just bounce it down to stems. So you go into the project, you export whatever you want to have. So for example, you just solo your kick, you export it, you just solo your bass, or maybe if you don't mind having it together, you solo it together, and then you export it and you just drag in the audio here and you remove the original group here. And that thing is really a huge game changer because then you can come down from that 500 millisecond, one second latency down to a really fast reacting thing. It depends a bit what you need. So for example, in this arrangement, face here. I don't need to have it reacting super fast, but when I do my brainstorms, I do exactly this. I quickly open up another project so that I can show you. For example, I'm doing a brainstorm here and I want to have this project super fluid because I want to really see whenever I hit something on my keyboard that reacts immediately here in the MIDI so that I can really jam to it. And what I did here is I bounced my kick and bass down to that stem as I explained. And if I look here in the current project, I have this one here, kick and bass stem. And you find in the same project this kick and bass D sharp channel, which contains all the MIDI. So I have the MIDI from the kick I created and I have the MIDI from the bass I created. And this is super slow because of all the EQs and processing there. I didn't want to have this in here as does created this huge latency, which I showed you in the beginning. Here I can really work with 64, 32 samples buffering. And then I create 10 leads, for example. And then I go back in the project and 
store them as a group as well. So I can make one brainstorm, 10 leads, store them in the project, make another 10, store them in the project. And then when I come to arranging it, I can bring everything back and I don't need to have the project as fast reacting anymore. So that's my super huge tip on how to deal with huge media lag and latency. If you want to learn more workflow tips to improve your music production and produce faster, and I have a whole playlist up here which helps you to improve your own workflow.